We are continuing in the book of Genesis, and uh, we are studying about the foundations of civilization, the foundations of marriage, family, everything is found in the book of Genesis, and so we're excited about doing that. Our, uh, the kids can be dismissed if they haven't already. So with our new schedule, um, you know, with cl- the class over there at 9.15, many of the kids will stay over there. As you can tell, there wasn't a lot of kids in church this morning because they were already over there. And so when you come at 10.30 for the worship service, you feel free to take the kids to the service over there before you come over here if you want, or you could bring them in here for the song service and let them be dismissed after the songs. It's, it's your choice. We're flexible on that. But that's why you didn't see many kids because there's about 18 of them already over there having a good time with their own worship service. They do music and songs and things like that as well as a gospel-centered lesson from there. All right, so this morning our scripture reader is Larry Medina. There he is. Give Larry, welcome Larry this morning. He'll be reading from Genesis chapter 14. And you all follow along on the screen as Larry reads for us right there. How are you doing this morning? Great, how about you? Great, great. All right. Ready to roll? Can y'all hear me? Want to try, want to try the other one? Okay. There we go. All right. Good deal. After his return from defeat from Chandelamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God the Most High. After he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, by God Most High, processor of the heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said, Abram, give me the persons that take the goods from yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hands to the Lord. God most high, processor of heavens and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest ye say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went out with me. Let Anir, Eshkuth, and Mamir take their share. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we are thankful for your word, that that is what we have to meditate on and to learn from this morning. We're not depending upon Gary and his thoughts and and my ideas of things. We're leaning upon the Holy Spirit of God to teach us this morning. So, Father, bring us to the place where our hearts are ready to receive what you have for us this morning. Help us to learn from Abram and his example for us this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you remember Kronk had a, a guy, uh, was it Gronk? Gronk, right? Anyway, guy, anyway, he had a, the good angel and the bad angel and all that. And of course you see that in cartoons in life a lot. And kind of that's what Abram's experience here to see today is he has a good king and a bad king. And they're both trying to influence him on which way to go. And so today is basically about the tale of two kings. And that's what Abram experiences this morning. So uh, this is what we like to do at Revolution Church. We study books of the Bible verse by verse. And so this is, the, this is the, the great story that we're at today. We're actually taking fewer verses than we normally do because there's so much here in this passage. So what, just to catch up on the backstory is Abram and Lot were being blessed by God and they had lots of abundance of cattle and employees and sheep and servants and things like that. And it grew so much that their two territories were overlapping and it was causing disputes between their employees and and their their herdsmen. And so the herdsmen were starting to say, hey, this is our spot, this is our cow, whatever, and they're arguing over things. And Abram confronts Lot and says, hey, you know, let's not let this get between us. You pick an area and you go your way and I'll go the opposite. If you go south, I'll go north. If you go east, I'll go west. Now, it's interesting that he offers all that when God had promised Abram the promised land. So I don't know if that was his prerogative to offer, but God in his sovereignty allowed Lot to choose south, and he chose the plains towards Sodom and Gomorrah because they were well watered and it looked very prosperous where he could let make a lot of money. Kind of was like a hyperlink back to 
Adam and Eve in the garden, they saw the fruit and they thought it would make them better. It actually made things worse. And the same happened for Lot. Lot went from pitching his tent on the edge of Sodom to where eventually he's one of the leaders in the city, but that hasn't happened yet. But um, there was four kings who were ruling over five other kings. And so picture, you know, you might be picturing humongous empires, but really what you need to picture is Danbury, Lake Jackson, Pearland, and Alvin, you know, rising up against, you know, four other little small towns. That's kind of what it was. And each, each king was king over a town, and that was a walled city. And so that's what set them apart. And so those, those, those one uh, bunch of kings, the five kings, were being uh, vassal states, basically being subjected to taxation and servitude. And they got tired of it after 12 years. So in the 13th year, they rebelled against it. But the four kings shut them down. And they said, okay, that's the way you want to play. We're going to take everything you have. And so they took a lot of their possessions. They took a lot of people, the younger people to be servants. And guess who got caught up in the mix? Lot does. So Lot and all his possessions get carried away. Well, this one guy escapes. He comes running to Abram and says, hey, you know, Lot just got captured and carried off. And I just thought you'd want to know. So Abram puts together his own little army. Anybody remember how many guys? 318, really small army. And when they get there but at night, they do a sneak attack in the middle of the night. They divide up into two groups and they basically run them off. They chase these guys 40 miles and just run them off and they take all the possessions back. So after all this happened, after they beat these four kings that were under one king, Kedalamar, and the kings who were with them, this is when all this happened. And right off the bat, when you experience a victory in your life, when something's really going good, let's say you get a promotion, okay? Or maybe you have a birth of a child, or maybe you get a raise, something good happens. Be watchful, because that's when Satan wants to tempt you. It's not always in the midst of your failure. Sometimes it's also in your success. Think about Elisha. Elijah took on the hundreds of prophets of Baal. And man, what a, what a, uh, a smackdown it was. I mean, he made fun of them, he ridiculed them, and he says, whoever can call down fire from their God first wins. And of course, the prophets of Baal, they're working all day and all into the evening, and nothing, nothing, nothing. They're cutting themselves, they're panicking, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff and incantations to call down fire from a God who doesn't exist. And Elijah goes, okay, it's now, it's my turn. And I'm not just going to call down fire on the sacrifice. Bring me gallons and gallons and buckets and buckets and barrels and barrels of water. And just pour it. Douse the whole thing. And I'm going to show you that my God can not only call down fire from heaven, but he can light it up really big. And of course, God answers. So Elijah's thinking, man, this is great. The whole country is going to repent of their Baal worship and all that. And they didn't. And he got discouraged. And Jezebel, that, that queen who wore way too much makeup, said to him, I, I'm going to kill you. And he gets all discouraged and like a puppy dog runs into the woods with his tail between his legs. Right after a great victory, he was so emotionally drained that he just collapsed spiritually. And that, that's often what happens to us. Um, Jesus, right after his baptism, right after he announcing his ministry, right after John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, all this great, what happens next? He's called out into the wilderness. Now, Jesus... Unlike Elisha, he does not fail, but he goes through 40 days of temptation. So be prepared that when things happen to you for the good, that it might be followed up with some type of temptation or some type of problem. And that's what happened to Abram. After this massive defeat, he's going to be tested. And so after being drained from great victory, we can be vulnerable to spiritual attacks. So watch out for the thing. It's not just in your failures, but sometimes it's in your successes as well. So after this, the kingdom, king of Sodom went out to meet him. Now, what do we know about Sodom? Great place to raise a family, right? <laughs> no, not at all. Very, very, very wicked, immoral place, okay? And so this, as Abram's going around that area, he's going through the valley, he's not going near it, the king comes out to meet him. And he, and he, and he has an offer for him. But, and then there's another king that comes out to meet him. His name is Melchizedek. Now, there's a great name for your next child, okay? But his, he is the king of Salem, Okay? And Salem is, will eventually become Jerusalem. So it's, he's the king of Jerusalem, but it's much smaller at this time. And he brought with him bread and wine. Does that sound familiar? 
We'll talk about that more in a minute. But not only is he a king, he is the priest, which is rare. We'll talk about that as well. But he is a priest. A priest is someone who is an intermediary between God and man. So he's a king over God's people, but he's also an intermediary between God and man and the king of the most high God. And, and Melchizedek blesses him. And he said, bless you, Abraham, by the mo- God the most high. And this God is the possessor of the whole universe, of everything in heaven, everything in earth. Everything belongs to him. So you just won a great victory. You've got a lot of spoils of victory and all that. But you know who owns more than, than you do? You know who owns everything? The Most High God owns it all. And he says, blessed be, and then all, he not only did he bless Abram, he blessed God. He said, blessed be God, Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. He's reminding Abram, hey, you didn't win because you had 318 superheroes. You won against thousands because God was on your side. That's one of the things that goes with victory is sometimes we can think, look what I did. <laughs> Look, look how much I accomplished, you know. Don't forget that it's everything we have, including the breath in our lungs, is by the grace of God. So when good things happen, what Melchizedek is telling him, hey, Abraham, you're blessed by God. Now you need to bless God in return. You need to give thanks to God and remember where all this came from. Now, you, you hear me talk often about chiastic structures. And there's one in this passage right here. A chiastic structure is like a sandwich. You know, you got bread, bread. And you got, you know, mayonnaise, mustard, whatever. And then you got lettuce. And you, what's the center of the sandwich is the meat. That's the main thing. Well, here's a chiastic structure in this passage right here. The king of Sodom, he, the story begins with him. It ends with him. He's just the bread. And he's not very healthy bread at that. And then the next part is you've got two different people giving gifts to God. You've got Melchizedek, the, the, um, the king of Salem, the king of Salem, sorry. He brought out bread and wine, which is significant of more than just that he basically put on a banquet bread and wine was just the feature of the highlights but he basically performed a banquet he's giving this as a gift to abram and then of course the parallel part is abram then gives a tenth of everything to god so you see this worshipful sacrifice and things being given a banquet being given a tithe being given as well but what's at the center of it abraham is blessed by god abraham turns around and blesses god so the blessing is what it's the most important part of the passage we just read. That's what a chiastic structure does. It points you to the most important part. So blessing, realizing that you're blessed of God, should turn around and make us bless God. Now you say, well, God blessed Abram with all this stuff, health, family. What do we bless God with? What do we give to God? Well, you see that there's a tithe that was given, but it's also about praise, it's about saying, God, I love you. I thank you. I give you the, all the credit for everything that's happened in my life. That's what, that's what God wants to see. You can't give God food or clothing or anything like that, but you can give the, God the praise that he is worthy of. So he said, blessed be God most high. So some people, as I was reading this, studying this past week, there's a lot of theologians that thought that, not a lot, a few, some that thought that Melchizedek was a pagan god but he's coming out here and acknowledging Abram's God. It's, no, that's not it at all. Because that has his theology right. He is a worshiper of the true God. And what's interesting is that he's a priest before there's a priesthood. You know, the Levitical priesthood comes later, right? Under Moses and Aaron and the Aaronic priesthood, which creates the Le- Le- Levitical priesthood. But here this guy is a priest of the Most High God because he's been appointed specifically by God. And we'll talk about him more in just a moment. So, he says, you know, God is the one, Abram, who delivered all your enemies in your hand. And what a victory it was. It was an amazing victory. And we see those type of battles, right? Gideon had his 300 that took on thousands. We see that over and over again where God doesn't say, hey, let me do it all by myself. I want to use people, but just keep in mind that I'm using you, but I'm the one who's your short sword and your shield. And so what does he give? He gives a tenth, which is, the word is a tithe. And he gave it of everything. Now, there's somebody that's going to say, and I hear this all the time, well, Christians don't have to tithe because tithing is under the law, and we're no longer under the law. Well, Abram isn't either. Who gave us the law? Moses. Is Moses even alive yet? No. Here's a guy tithing before the law. Okay? So tithing was before the law. It was under the law. 
And then we also see um, Abraham tied, it was hundreds and hundreds of years before the law. So to say it's under the law and now we're no longer under the law is, is a false premise. It's a non sequitur. It, 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 the argument doesn't hold up. And then somebody say, yeah, but under the law they gave 23 and a third. That's true. They gave 10% as an act of worship. They gave 10% it was basically t- taxation. And then every third year they gave another 10%, which was basically the welfare system for the poor. So it added up to 23 and a third. And so people, people who are skeptics against tithing say, oh, you say, well, if you're going to tithe, you better give 23 and a third. Well, that, that's true if you live under a theocracy. I mean, their government was where God was their king, and they had the Aaronic priesthood, and they tithed to the temple to support the priesthood and to support the, the welfare system, to support all the government. They did that, so it was 10% religious, 10% governmental, and a third that was basically social welfare. And so if you live in a theocracy, that makes sense, but we don't live under a theocracy. Jesus affirmed tithing when they were no longer under uh, a theocracy. In Luke chapter 11, he's telling the Pharisees they're being hypocrites because you tithe off every little herb in your garden, the mint and the rue and every herb, but you neglect justice and the love of God. What, he's saying, what good is it if you give 10% of everything you have to the temple, but you won't even be nice to your neighbor who's poor and needy? He said, these things you ought to have done. You should tithe, but don't neglect the other issues. So Jesus is saying, yeah, tithe, but don't be a jerk for a neighbor. Go ahead and be nice and help the poor as well as tithing. So Jesus doesn't disband it. But Some people say, well, but I can't afford to tithe. And again, I don't preach on money very often, but since Abraham tithed, we're, we're going to talk, discuss it this morning. Well, let me challenge you what Malachi says. He says, you should bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. That's how God's storehouse is taken care of. And thereby, put me to the test, says the Lord. The only time in the Bible where God gives permission to test him. Test me. See if I won't pour out a blessing on you. And he says, it will not, see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. I'm not saying sow your seed, you know, and God's going to give you a raise next week. No, I'm not saying that at all. God is saying that everything you have comes from me. 10% of it, I just want you to give it back. And then you live off the 90%. And it's amazing how we can live better off 90% than we can off 100% when God's the one managing it. But 10% of what we have belongs to God. That's why we don't, technically we don't give the tithe, we return the tithe. Years ago, my sister Gwen, um, she house sat for a multimillionaire. This guy had five homes across the United States. One of them was in Pennsylvania. He lived there for basically five weeks out of the year. He said he hired my sister to live there for the other 47 weeks of the year. He paid her to live there. He deposited money into her account, and he said, hey, pay the electric bill, pay the water bill, pay all these things, and then you keep the rest. What if when she got all the money deposited in her account, she decided to spend it all, and you know, he gets a bill in the mail saying, hey, the light bill hasn't been paid. Like, Gwen, what are you doing? Well, I, I couldn't afford to pay the light bill. I had to use it for myself. No, no, that all is my money. I told you, just take care of this, and then you keep the rest. That's really the arrangement that God has given all of us. Everything we have is from him. A portion of it, he's just saying, hey, just give this back to me, and you live off the rest. Um, <clears throat> several years ago, just to give you a story, I was, when I was younger and single, I was struggling with tithing. I thought I couldn't afford it, and it was really, I would kind of give, but not give the full tithe and things like that, and I was, I was just really having a hard time with it, and I got convicted that I really needed to step up and, 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 and to give to the Lord what was His. And so I did my budget, and I thought, okay, if I tithe this amount, which is the whole, the, the whole 10%, I've got just enough money for gas to get the work and back and just enough for some groceries, but nothing else. Which is one thing tithing makes you do. It makes you budget better, okay? But I, I thought, okay, I've got to be real tight. I'm going to be real frugal. I used my cash envelope system. I put, here's the gas money in this envelope. And here's, the, here's the grocery money in this one. I'm not spending anything else. And I gave my tithe. So that Sunday, on the way home from church, I'm driving off FM 2004, and I have a flat tire. So I go and open up my trunk, and guess what? My spare is flat as well. And I'm like, oh, man. So I called, thankfully, I had roadside assistance, <clears throat> and I get towed to Discount Tire. And so, great, great place, by the way. And uh, so I get towed there, <clears throat> and I call my friend Mark Monocle, and I say, Mark, 
Here's what's happened. He said, no problem. He said, I'll meet you there. I'll let you use my Suburban to go to work on Monday. So I leave my car, discount tire, because they're closed on Sunday, and I put my key in the drop box. And the next morning, I'm driving his Suburban into Houston, where I was working at the time. And I called discount tire, and I left him a message saying, hey, key's in a drop box. Please put a tire on it. You know, match the others, whatever you can do. And so I, I'm thinking, man, how am I going to pay for this tire? I only had enough money for gas this week and for groceries, and now I've got this tire. So then, um, at the same time, I had rented a, a, a different house. And you know how when you rent a house, you put up first and last month's rent? So you write two different checks. At least that's how they did it back then. And I told the real estate agent, I said, okay, this is first month's rent. Go ahead and cash it. So I said, this one, can you please hold till Friday, the last month's rent? Because I didn't have an extra $1,400 laying around. And so she said, sure, no problem. Well, guess who forgot? and deposited both. Well, I didn't have the extra 1400 so five checks bounced at Chase Bank. And at that time, it was $35 a check. So do the math, 175 that I wasn't expecting, plus this tire that I wasn't expecting. I'm like, oh, so this is how tithing works. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh, man, what's going on here? So <clears throat> that afternoon, I'm leaving work. I'm stuck in Houston traffic, and um, I called Discount Tire, and I told them, hey, I'm going to be a few minutes late. I know you close at 6, but I'll probably be there about 10 after. And he said, no problem, I'll be here. But also, that day, I also got a call, which this never has happened before and never happened since. I know none of you have ever bounced checks before, but usually if you bounce a check, you have to go there and grovel and say, please, could you forgive this or whatever? And they'll say, well, you bounced four, we'll forgive two, you know. Or since you never bounced any before, we'll forgive three or whatever. Well, I had five. And before I could call the bank, the bank manager called me and says, hey, I noticed something weird going on with your account. Did something happen? And I told him the whole story about the checks. He said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and refund all of them. Okay? So then I pull up the discount tire about 10 after. There's no cars on the parking lot except the manager. The manager walks out of the store with the keys and says, here you go, Mr. Boburn. You're good to go. I said, yeah, I, well, I need to come in and pay. He said, he said no, this tire's on us. Just remember discount tire you need, when you need tires again. Now, the five bounce checks and the cost of the tires was almost to the penny what I had tithed. Does God know what he's doing or not? You know, and I'm just saying we need to trust God that you can do better on 90% than you can on 100% where you, where you want to control. So we have these two kings, the king of Sodom and the king of Salem. There's Bera, the king of Sodom. His name means son of evil. Sounds like he's you, know, you can tell that what's going on in Sodom is starting at the top. Melchizedek, his name means the king of righteousness. There's quite a contrast between these two. Also, king of Sodom, he's a godless and a wicked man. Okay? Again, he's a king. He, he's in total control with all the wickedness that's happening in this city, and yet he's allowing it. But the king of Salem, he's godly and he's holy. The king of Sodom, is a, he's ruling over a city full of sin, but Salem means the city of peace. Sodom said, the king of Sodom says, hey, let me give you all this stuff here, you know, and, and, and you can be prestigious and all that stuff. And, the, and yet the king of Salem says, no, here's a banquet for you. I just want to show you that I appreciate you and I want to pray over you and offer you God's blessings. The king of Sodom, he's a promoter of the lowest form of sin and the king of Salem is a priest of the most high God. So, who exactly is this guy, Melchizedek? There's different theories, and so this morning I want to kind of get a little deep here, so strap on your, your thinking caps here, and welcome to Theology 101. We're going to get kind of heavy here. This is what can be called by some people a Christophany. There's another word called a Theophany. It's where God or Jesus or both appear in human form in the Old Testament prior to the Incarnation. Now, the Incarnation is not just another appearance. The incarnation is when the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, and then Jesus permanently stayed in a physical body. Prior to that, Jesus did not have a physical body. On the incarnation, from all eternity, Jesus will always be in a body. And you'll always see his nail-scarred hands, and, and you'll see where he was pierced, okay? So some people think this was a Christophany. <clears throat> a Christophany is a pre-incarnate physical appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And just for the sake of full disclosure, this is kind of where I landed for years, but I'm not an expert on the subject, but I think I've changed my mind on it. Another possibility, well, this is not another possibility, sorry. 
usually, not always, but usually a Christophany in the Old Testament is introduced by the angel of the Lord. Now sometimes they'll say an angel of the Lord, but then when usually when it says the angel of the Lord, that means Christ in physical appearance. For example, later we're going to see in Genesis 18 where three men will come to Abram. And then the Bible tells us two of them were angels, one of them was God. I believe this was this one is a Christophany, that Jesus Christ and two angels appeared to Abraham here. Another time you see Elisha, I'm sorry, um, Jacob, wrestling with God in Genesis 32. And here I believe he is wrestling with the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. This is a, a Christophany. Another time we see in Second King there's a battle. And the angel of the Lord, which again I believe is Jesus Christ incarnate, pre-incarnate, kills 185,000 Assyrians in one night. And then in Genesis 16, Hagar is chased out by Sarai, you know, into the wilderness, and then an angel of the Lord appears to her and tells her it's all going to be okay. And again, I think that was Jesus Christ. But when it comes to Melchizedek, is this a Christophany? Or is this a type? So let's talk about typology. There's, there's Christophanies, but there's also types. A type is when a person in the Old Testament behaves in a way that corresponds to Jesus' character or actions in the New Testament. It doesn't mean it is Jesus, it just means it points to Jesus. It can also be an object or an event in the Old Testament that can be viewed as re representative of some quality that points to Jesus. For example, in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Since we have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that opened for us through the curtain... And what does the curtain represent? His flesh. So when Jesus Christ was crucified, what happened to the curtain? It was ripped from top to bottom. So it's a picture of Christ. When his flesh was torn, the curtain was torn. So the curtain is a type of Jesus. The curtain isn't Jesus. It's a type of Jesus. Another example in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It says that Christ is our Passover lamb. Now, Christ was not incarnated into the Lamb. The Lamb points to Jesus Christ. So that's why John the Baptist says, Behold what? The Lamb of God. Which, so he's basically saying, Here's our Passover. Christ, Christ is not only the Lamb, He's the event. He is the, 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 the holiday of the Passover. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus signifies that Jonah, being in the belly of the fish, three days and three nights, points to his burial, three days and three nights. So you see, that's a type of Christ in that event there. So there's a difference between a type and an illustration or an analogy. We're getting a, a, a layer deeper here. So there's a type is specifically identified in the New Testament. In other words, all the ones I just gave you, Jesus said, Jonah and the whale, that is a type of me. But there's others that the New Testament doesn't identify, but they're very obvious. For, let me give you some examples of that. So a, an illustration or analogy is, is very apparent, but it's not identified in the New Testament. So we have to be careful of those. For example, Joseph. He is not a type of Christ, because nowhere in the New Testament does Peter, Paul, or Jesus, anybody say, Joseph's a type of me, a fulfillment of me. But the, the illustration of Jesus, you can't miss it. For example, if you remember the story of Joseph, right? He's his father's favorite son just like Jesus. He had a promise of someday he'd be exalted, just like Christ. He was mocked by his family, just like Jesus was. He was sold for pieces of silver. He was stripped of his robe. He was delivered up to the Gentiles. He was falsely accused. Remember the whole story of Potiphar's wife accusing him and Jesus was falsely accused as well. Um, he was faithful amidst temptation he, and there's a whole, I mean, that's the, the list. When we get to that story in Genesis, I'll, go, I'll give you a more complete list. But you see how all those things about Joseph point to Jesus? Yet nowhere in the New Testament says that he's a type, but it's very clear. So some things are labeled for us and some things are still abundantly clear, but we can't just say that they're that way necessarily. For example, when the three Hebrew children are in the fire, we, Nebuchadnezzar looks in the fire and says, hey, I, I see a fourth guy. Now, we don't know for a fact it was Jesus, but it's pretty clear that it probably was. But we can't, it's an illustration of Jesus who goes through the fire with us and delivers us. But we can't say for a fact that it was. So it would be an illustration, not necessarily a type. Ruth and Boaz. 
Ruth is the kinsman redeemer who redeems the life of a Gentile woman and brings her into the family of God. Beautiful picture there. But does the New Testament ever say Boaz is a type of Jesus? It doesn't. But again, the, the, the evidence is there. So exactly who is Melchizedek? Is he a Christophany? Is he Christ appearing to Abram here? Or is he just a type? Well, let me, let's go to Hebrews chapter 7. For, fortunately, we have one of the epistle writers who gives us a full commentary on this whole story. He says, For the Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abram, Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, now the, the most important thing you need to know about this guy is the translation of his name, king of righteous. That's what Melchizedek means. And then the second thing about him is king of Salem, which is the area he was king over, is he's the king of peace. So this guy is the king of righteous, king of peace, by his name and by his location. And then here's the thing that people get, uh, here's the people thing that, that people disagree on. That's what I'm trying to say. It says that Melchizedek is without father or mother or genealogy. And those who think that, oh, see, that is Jesus. Jesus doesn't have a real father or mother, doesn't have a genealogy. He is infinite. He's the eternal God. And having neither beginning of days or end of life. And that's why there's so many pastors who say, yes, this is Christ. That's what I, I used to believe, okay? But as you study further, what was happening with Melchizedek, because peop, there was nothing recorded, these things weren't recorded. There was no, they didn't record who his mother was or his father was, and they didn't record his genealogy. See, the Levitical priests, they always had all these genealogies to prove where you came from. But Melchizedek was appointed by God, so who his mother was and who his father was didn't matter what his genealogy was. So it's not that he literally didn't have a father and mother, it's that it didn't matter. But then they didn't record his birth, the year because priests, they recorded the year they were born, the year that they died. At 50, they had to retire, all these things like that. And they said with Melchizedek, it didn't matter. So legend began to be that, that this guy was just eternal. But that's not what they were saying back then. So it's, for example, in Jude, it talks about Janus and Jambres, how they fought with Moses. Well, the Bible never tells us it was Janus and Jambres. Legend said it was, and he's just quoting legend. So I know that sounds kind of complicated, but let me give you some reasons why I believe it's, he's not the incarnate Christ, but he's just a type. It says he's resembling the Son of God. If he truly was Jesus, why didn't it just say he is the Son of God? It didn't say that. So I think he's a type of Christ and not, the, not a Christophany. So w which one is it? I believe he's not a Christophany, but he's a beautiful type of Christ, which is nothing less. It's not something to be diminished. So let me tell you some ways that Jesus is like Melchizedek. They're both called the king of righteousness. Jesus is the prince of peace. Later he's exalted the king of kings. Melchizedek was the king of peace. They're both a priest and a king. What's interesting about that is, you study Old Testament characters, Samuel was a prophet and a priest, right? David was a king and a prophet because he prophesied about the crucifixion of Christ and all those things like that. Melchizedek is a priest and a king. So you've got those three offices, prophet, priest, and king. All, several guys have been two out of three. Most people were only one of the three. But guess who was the only one to be three of three? Jesus Christ. He is the prophet, not just a prophet. Like the Muslims will teach you, Jesus is just another prophet. And Muhammad is the greatest prophet. He's a greater prophet than Jesus Christ. No, the Bible clearly teaches Jesus is the prophet. All these other guys just point to Jesus. Jesus is the prophet. He is the priest. He is the mediator between God and the Father and man. And he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the one that truly has no beginning or end, not just a legend. And he's the one um, that is greater than the whole Levitical priesthood. See, the Levitical priesthood started later, but this is a separate priesthood that God initiated outside and before Israel. So there's one more about Jesus being like Melchizedek, but I want to come back to that later. So the king of Sodom says, hey, give me my people back, and you take all this, the booty for yourself. Now, he's not in a position to negotiate. Okay, think about this. The king of Sodom has just been defeated by these Kedalamar and all of his kings. And then Abraham defeats them. So Abram's two layers above. You, I just defeated the guys who defeated you. So I don't think you're in a position to negotiate. And by the way, here, the king of Sodom represents Satan. Satan will tempt you and offer you all kinds of things. Do you realize he has no authority to negotiate with you whatsoever? 
There's nothing that he can give you that you could even want or need. Everything you already need and have is provided by the king of righteousness. But he'll negotiate anyway. He'll, he'll tempt you into things like that. But he says, hey, you know, could you please just give me back my people and you keep the goods. And notice what he says, keep the goods for who? For yourself. Whenever you're tempted by something, you're wondering, is this a temptation or an opportunity? If it's all about you, <laughs> and it's not an opportunity to bless others, it's probably not from God. It's probably from Satan tempting you. And Abraham, I, I picture Abraham raising his voice here, okay? You can read it if you want to. He said, I have lifted my hand to the Lord. Now, what do you do when you lift your hand? You go to court, what happens? I promise to tell the, whole, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. He swore a vow, okay? He said, I have raised my hand in God's court to say that God, who's the possessor of everything <laughs> and all this junk you want to give me, you know, God, my God owns everything, okay? And he says that I would not take even a thread or a sandal strap, anything that's yours. I don't, I don't want your stuff. I don't want your junk, okay? And here's why. Lest you could go back and say, I made Abraham rich. You see, this guy wanted the credit for what God had done. Who won the victory? God did. But what does Satan always try to do? He tries to get the credit for what God has done. He tries to steal glory from God. Isn't that Satan's original sin? He wanted to be like the Most High. He's, he's leading all the angels in worship of God. He's like, man, I want a piece of this action here. Why don't you all worship me too? And God's like, that ain't happening. And he was cast out like lightning. That battle didn't last at all. What's the speed of light? Boom, that's how fast Satan was cast out of heaven for his rebellion and one-third of the angels with him. Okay, so he says, I, I know what your agenda is. You're sitting there offering me all this stuff, which I can keep anyway. <laughs> what are you, you're offering me something I already have. I'm the one who won the battle. This all could be mine, but I don't want it. Okay, and it says, so I, but you're really just wanting to get credit and glory from all this. We need to be really weary of what people are doing to manipulate us. And we also need to be aware of what we are doing to get or to draw attention. Jesus warned us of that. He said, beware of practicing your righteous before other people in order to be seen by them. So you do something good. But if you talk about it, then what was your motivation? <laughs> you know, you donate something to the church. But you tell everybody you donated it. What's your motivation? He says, for then... If you do that, if you do it to be seen, you will have what, everybody? No reward from your Father in heaven. So you stand before God in judgment, and, uh, and you're like, hey, God, remember when I do this? He said, yeah, I do. <laughs> so, well, do I get a crown or some jewels for that? No, remember when you bragged about to everybody? That was it. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was your reward. He said, so we need to be careful about what our motivation is. Two people can do the exact same good deed and one be rewarded for it, and one not, because motivation. He says, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet. So believe it or not, at the temple, there was a special offering box for the needy. And the Pharisees would actually have guys go before them and blow a trumpet and say, doo, 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 hear ye, Did you like my trumpet there? Hear ye, hear ye, Rabbi Shmuel is now giving 200 denarii to the poor. And they would pour all the change in. They, they'd have it transferred into the smallest amount of coins so that they could pour as many coins into it and be like, you know, and they, they would be like, wow, isn't he amazing? And everybody gloated about how much they gave and they bragged about it. He said, you know, before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that, and why do they do it? They give money to the poor that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received a reward. So when you get to heaven, there's no credit in God. Uh, agenda there for you if you do it for the wrong motivation. This is a true story. I used to go to church with a guy who stuck his tithe envelope in his shirt pocket, facing out where you could see the amount. And he'd walk around on Sunday, you know, for everybody to say, hey, how you doing this morning? Kind of pull you in his, you know, <laughs> no joke. And he would have that right there. And he could have turned it around, but he had it with the amount out. This is not an actual photo. This is the one I made, okay? But anyway, man, be careful of that. Be careful. What Jesus says, hey, don't even let your le right hand know what your left hand's doing. Give anonymously. Give secretly. Give, do what you do. Don't do it for credit. Do it because you genuinely love the other person in need. 
that you give to the glory of God, that you love his church, that you love missions, you love giving to missionaries that we give to in Ghana, West Africa, in Spain, and in the Philippines, and all those different places. You do it because you love that. You don't brag about it. You don't sound a trumpet and say, hey, look what I did. So Abram's like, I don't, I don't want any of your stuff. He said, all, all I want is what the young men have already eaten because I can't give that back to you. you know, I, I have some soldiers they needed to eat while we're traveling here, fighting this battle, delivering you, you know, from being you know, captive here. And he said, you know, from the men with, with me. And then, you know, I did have some allies. I had the, the king of these other villages nearby and the names on there. Let them take their share. But as for me, I, I don't want any of your stuff. So, you know, the, in everyday life, we are faced with, two kings that come out to meet us. We don't even necessarily go looking for them. They, they come looking for us. And first of all, there's the king of Sodom, which again comes in the form of Satan. And he offers us wealth and prestige. He says, you know, if you do this, you'll make more money. Maybe it's not totally ethical, but that's okay. Nobody's watching. You know, and you can work extra time and overtime. Your family won't miss you. You need to pay the bills. And he's going to offer you all kinds of things and wealth and prestige. And then yet the king of Salem offers us true peace and righteousness, that we can just be content with what we have. The king of Sodom, he wants you to take things for yourself. Isn't that what he said to Abram? Take this for yourself. Not for your people, not so you can rescue others, but take this for yourself. And the king of Salem wants you to give to God your tithe. The king of Sodom Sodom offers you immediate gratification. Here, now, 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 you can have this. You know, you need to be really careful of that. You know, if you notice when salesmen press you, if you buy this today, we'll make this deal. Like, I can't have this deal tomorrow? What's the hurry? You know, it's because they're appealing to your, your in, that need for immediate grat- gratification. But the king of Salem urges you to focus on what's eternal. Maybe I won't have as much now, but I'm focused on eternity and who's going to be in heaven with me and how many souls can we reach for the gospel of Christ and what, what is eternal. The king of Sodom wants you to be indebted to him. You see, if you keep all this stuff, then I'll tell people I'm the one who made you rich. But the king of Sodom wants you to give all the blessing and all the glory to God. So you mentioned, I, remember I mentioned earlier that there's one, way, one more way that Jesus is like Melchizedek? He gives bread and wine. Those two words, I mean, that's, that's a hyperlink forward to the New Testament, right? It, what did Jesus say? He took the cup of wine And when he had given thanks, he said, take this. And he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Melchizedek points forward to our Savior who comes out offering his blood and his body broken and poured out for us. That's what Melchizedek is about. Galatians 1.4 says, Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us, not from some kings from an evil country, but to deliver us from the ultimate king of Sodom, from Satan, and from the penalty of our sin, and to deliver us from this evil age according to the will of God our Father. Have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You see, all of us have an appointment with death. We will someday die, and someday there will be a funeral for us. And then you, the Bible says it's appointed a man once to die, and then after this, the judgment. And when you stand before the Lord in judgment and he says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? It's not going to say, well, I was a good person. No, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. You say, well, it's because I got baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. It's just a public profession of what you've done. The only answer that will matter is I've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he died for my sins. And we can all name our sins, right? I believe he buried all my sins in the tomb. And on the third day, he rose victorious with eternal life for all who would trust in him. When you make that decision to trust Christ, the Bible says you are born again. This is what Melchizedek points to. He comes out to Abraham and offers him bread and wine, just like Christ offers his body and his blood for us. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who is our great high priest, greater than Melchizedek. And Father, thank you for the offering, the banquet banquet that he offers, that we could be satisfied and fed because of his broken body and his shed blood. And we give you praise for our Savior. Father, I just pray for one or two that might be here today, or some that are watching online that may not know Jesus as their Savior. I pray that today would be their day of salvation. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God 
would peel back the scales from their eyes and remove the darkness and let them see the light of Jesus Christ, our glorious Savior. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. If you made a decision to trust Christ or you want to know more about how to do that, maybe you still have questions, that's my cell phone number. Call me, text me anytime, and I would love to talk to you about that. Um, and also, if you know someone who you would love to have sitting here with you to hear these messages in Genesis, I encourage you to pray for them and invite them to join us next week. And also, for those of you who are reading along, in the, in the, there's a Bible reading plan that goes with this on Version. You can look it up or ask me for the link. We'll send it to you, and you can join the discussion there on this great Bible reading plan. Amanda, would you like to come help me with um, Q&A this morning? So if you have a question, there's the cell phone number. You can text that in right now. Or if you'd rather, you can just raise your hand and ask that. A question about anything about the message or anything at all uh, regarding the Bible or spiritual things, I'd love to give you an answer on that. that that's, that's excellent. I, that's one of the points I didn't make. But I, that, so yeah, if you believe in it, that, that Melchizedek was a Christophany, how many years was he the king of Salem? And see, that's also not consistent with the other Christophanies which seem to happen and go away really quickly. You know, like with Jacob's Ladder and things like that. So that's another reason, for an argument for why it wasn't a Christophany. It was just a, a type. A good, great question. Very good. No, what's going on this morning? Okay, Charles. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so to give background to what Charles is asking. So our adult Bible class started this morning, the first one, you know, since pre-COVID when we used to have them. And they're going through a series called The Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And the number one mark as a church that studies the Bible verse by verse. So this is what we try to do here and what I try to do as the preaching elder here. Um, and so you're saying, how does that translate into your every daily walk? Well, one is that's why we offer the reading plan. So you can be studying along with what I'm teaching every week so that the church literally can be of one mind and focus on the same thing. That doesn't mean you can't obviously study other things. But what you study, you should study. Try to study through a book of the Bible. Now you can find all kinds of reading plans or whatever or books about success or how to communicate better, be a better husband or wife. Those are all good, but sometimes they take a verse here, a verse there. You know, we're, infant, we're really notorious for taking Jeremiah 29, 11 out of context and Philippians 4, 13 out of context. And so sometimes devotionals will pinpoint all the Bible, things like that, instead of taking you through a study. So I recommend that you pick a book of the Bible. Like even, for example, right now the, the teens were going through the book of James. So read the Bible in the way that was written. Just like I said in the lesson, um, if someone mailed you a three-page letter, you wouldn't just say, oh, I like this part here, I'm going to highlight that latest part here, and forget the rest of the letter. You would start at the beginning, read it through carefully, then go back through and underline and highlight and kind of figure out what are the four things they really want me to do out of this letter, etc. cetera. So, um, so good reading plans by good authors is you know, dependable. I could even, if you want, I could send you a list of who I would recommend as gospel-focused uh, authors that to read. Um, of course, you know I'm a big fan of Tim Keller um, and others like that that you could read. Anything possibly with the Gospel Coalition is a great resource as well. All right. Um, more a comment. Even in Psalm 110, David mentioned Melchizedek. Yes. In fact, I was going to put that in this in the passage this morning. I thought, well, I've already got a lengthy passage here with Hebrews, but it's prophesied that Jesus would be the fulfillment after the priesthood of Melchizedek in the psalm that you referenced there. And, that, and it's, it's where David says, the Lord said unto my Lord. Remember, Jesus quotes that. And he says, well, who is he talking to? You know, that, That's why we can see the Trinity right there in the Bible, that God the Father said to God the Son. You know, So a lot of people say, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible, but I, I believe the Bible. You know, so there's a lot of things that we label, like Christophany. We believe in them, but you don't see the word in the Bible. So don't let someone fool you on that. Also, um, you will see when there's... Peculiar passages like this, like Melchizedek, cults like to jump on that and tell you what it's not. The Mormons believe that the, the, the Melchized, Melchizedekian priesthood is still alive today and that Mormon young men are part of the Melchizedekian priesthood. And you know, a lot of things like that. So it, it's really kind of bizarre. Any, any other questions? That's All right, great. Yes, Lauren. Yeah, and I could recommend them. So maybe I should put together a list and put that out as well again. Um, but definitely try to go verse by verse. If you have a good study Bible, that always helps. But again, it's only as good as the people who write them. It doesn't mean they're, they're perfect, okay? Um, and I, you know what I teach isn't perfect. I mean, even on this issue, I change my mind. There's things we learn as we grow. 
And that's, that's where we want to study. And of course, the key, what is the key to all Bible interpretation? Tell me. What was it? Somebody answered the question. Context. Context, context, context. What does the verse mean in the chapter? What does the chapter mean in the book? What part of the, is it Old, Old or New Testament? When was it written? Who was it written to? Jimmy, question. Yeah, sure. So he uh, was a pastor at a church in Virginia, and he was called to God to start a church in New York City. And people are like, you can't start a church. People don't go to church in New York City. Literally less than 2% of the population have attended church. And he went to Manhattan, and he, it was really interesting. He, after Sunday morning, he would have question and answer session like this. And it got to be, so many people were flocking to it, and it got to be so long that they made the Sunday night service a whole question and answer session. So he'd give a short message on Sunday night, and tons of atheists and skeptics and agnostics flooded to his church and would ask all these hard questions. And that's how his church grew to you know, about 13,000 people. Now it's divided into five campuses. And now he has pancreatic cancer, but he's lasted a long time. My brother died of pancreatic cancer. He was diagnosed in May and gone in August. And he, Tim Keller's been fighting this for two years. So anyway, but yeah, any resources by him? Now, do we agree with him on everything? No. I mean, he believes in baptizing babies. We don't believe in that. We believe baptism is for believers. So, but we can, we, we agree on the gospel and other things like that. All right, last call. Any other questions? All right, hey, good job. Let's stand. And we're going to read this verse of scripture over our, ourselves as a church as a blessing so read with me Numbers chapter 6, starting on verse 24 aloud. This says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Happy New Year.